Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm uh, happy to finally uh, be able to give this course because it was twice postponed due to COVID. And so it should have happened in 2020 originally. But finally, finally we there we are. Um, OK, so <coughs> I want to start by defining um, an energy for uh, system of endpoints. So it's a sum of, uh, you're going to have pair interactions with an interaction kernel G, and then some potential energy in this form. And you have to think that x1, xn are endpoints living in a Euclidean space of dimension d. And uh, for the interaction kernel, we take a very specific form. So we're going to consider something of this form. Uh, let's say 1 over s x minus s. So uh, think of s as positive, but it could be sometimes negative but mostly positive. So this is a, a singular kernel that we'll call a risk kernel. And so that's for s different from 0. Uh, and formally, when s is 0, what you want to do is take the logarithmic interaction, which you can see as some sort of, uh, some sort of limit of this thing as s goes to 0. OK, so this is log. But all, both of these cases, I group in the term risk interactions. And there is a particularly interesting subcase of this particular interaction, which is the Coulomb case. That's the Coulomb case, is when s is d minus 2. Uh, as you know, this is the uh, interaction uh, in electrostatics in dimension 3. The potential is 1 over the distance. Uh, and uh, in dimension 2, it corresponds to the log case. You should have a log interaction. You can consider that in any dimension. And what's important about the Coulomb kernel, of course, is that it's a fundamental solution to the Laplacian. So if you take minus Laplacian of g with in this particular case, you get some constant, which depends on dimension, times uh, the Dirac mass at the origin. OK. The other thing I will consider is, of course, the Gibbs measure. Of course, no, but it's the Gibbs measure. So I'm going to take e to the minus beta hn. So let me write big Xn for uh, this whole n tuple. Sometimes we can abbreviate it with this notation, big Xn. And d big Xn is the obvious uh, notation as well. And here I'm going to add a little bit, a little scaling factor for convenience later. Um, I want to divide the energy by n to the s over d. Uh, the reasons for that will appear. But so far, it doesn't necessarily amount to a loss of generality, because this beta, after all, could also depend on n in principle. OK, and uh, then the zn beta is the normalization to make this a probability measure, it's called the partition function. OK, so when you do statistical mechanics, this is called uh, the canonical ensemble. And uh, it gives you the probability of observing the configuration in a certain state. 
given by this density. OK. Please feel free to interrupt, because uh, you know it, it will make the thing more lively. So I'm, I'm going to start by explaining why we care about things like that. Uh, and there is a there's a, a variety of uh, of motivation. I yes, I didn't say uh, anything about v. I should say that now. V, you think of it as a confining potential. And it has to be sufficiently regular and growing at infinity. And the reason for having V is that without it, um, the system is not confined. So for instance, if you want to minimize the energy, uh, the best is to just uh, let the points go to infinity. And you want to avoid that. So think, for example, the simplest case that's very common is take a quadratic potential, for instance. So with the normalization that's here, this n in front, the advantage of having n here is that it makes this term uh, of order n squared, because you have n terms n in front, and it matches the order of this interaction term, which is also of order n squared. So these two things balance. And the result of that is that your system gets confined to a finite size uh, region. Okay. OK, so motivations. Uh, one, first, I'm going to talk about motivations that only involve the energy, not even the Gibbs measure. Uh, one uh, example is uh, approximation theory. In approximation theory, what you want to do is you want to distribute points well, uh, sufficiently regularly, so that you can approximate the integral of a function by uh, a sampling on your, of your function at some points, right? So if you want uh, such an approximation to be accurate, uh, irrespective of the function f, you should distribute your points well. For instance, if you're on an interval, um, yeah, say from 0 to 1, what you want to do is you want to put your points regularly to make uh, just a, an exact uh, partition. But if you are, for instance, on a manifold, how do you do the analog of that? So this thing is also related to zeros of orthogonal polynomials. Uh, so minimize the sort of worst case error leads you to a conditioning problem. And when you look at the minimal conditioning, you find that you want to maximize the product of distances between the points. OK, so again, if you're in whole space, uh, this doesn't make, get, make much sense because the points will go to infinity. And uh, that's why either you add some sort of weight with which behave then in the end give you a confinement potential, or you do it on a manifold like a sphere. So for instance, on closed manifolds, then that makes sense. OK, but maximizing product of the distance is the same as minimizing minus log of the product of the distances. So you find that you're minimizing minus sum of log. And maybe you have the confinement, which corresponds to weights in your original problem. So it's a logarithmic interaction uh, problem. OK, so these are called fekete points, or sometimes weighted fekete points, if you have the weights, the weights as I said, give you the V. And there's a whole literature that studies these things. As I said, it's related to zeros of orthogonal polynomials. Um, 
sorry, the, okay, uh, when you say Piketty points, you have n points on a fixed space, so for each n you have a set of Piketty points. Yes, exactly. Which are obtained by minimizing. Yes, the they call that the Piketty points, the Piketty sets, yeah. That's in that, that's the terminology there. Okay, and so uh, you can see plots of a sphere, and you distribute your points on the sphere. And, you know, it looks very uniform, the distribution, but people uh, want to know, you know, how uniform it is really when you zoom, uh, when you look very closely. If, you're, if you take, a, let's say, a little ball or a spherical cap on your sphere, how many points you're re really going to see? <coughs> and... Uh, I, I will break uh, the suspense uh, for you, but when you look at the, at the distribution on the sphere, you see things that look very much like triangular lattices at, uh, at the microscopic scale. Okay, so the triangular lattice is what you see when you put uh, points. So because it's a blackboard talk, I'm not showing you the pictures, but it, when I have slides, you see these pictures. So you, you take the, the triangular lattice with the uh, equilateral triangle, and you, you know, you periodize this. So that's what you observe, except that uh, you cannot tile the, I mean, you cannot, you cannot cover your sphere well with such things, right? There's a topological problem, so you see defects on the spheres, defects in the lattice, and uh, these are the kinds of things that, well, they want to understand. Okay, and in approximation theory, what they also introduce is they introduce the RIS S energy problem that they also want to minimize, also on manifolds. Um, and here it's sum of 1 over xi minus xj to the s. Oh, and that's exactly what I was talking about here without the confinement. And now, what's interesting about the have seeing it like that is, is you have a family of problems. So you can let s go to zero. You get back the logarithmic case and the Fekete points here. And you can let s go to infinity, for instance. <coughs> and what you get when you let s go to infinity is the best packing problem. So solutions to that uh, tend to solutions of the best packing problem. The best packing, I mean, take hard spheres of a given uh, radius and try to put as many of them as possible is it in a given volume. Is it that the solution as S goes to infinity converges to some Beckett theorem, or is it that the solution of the limit problem is best packing? I, I think it's the, the solutions, when you take S to infinity, they converge to solutions of the best packing problem, which you can sort of guess heuristically from the shape of this uh, interaction. But okay, so you have a whole uh, family of problems, and you, then you want to understand how minimizers vary with S, and what they look like. So of course, now, in dimension two, Best packing problem is solved. So now I, if I get back to the flat space, right, in 2D, the solution is the triangular lattice, the one I, we just discussed. And you may have heard that very uh, recently there was progress on the best packing problems in dimensions 8 and 24. By... Uh, Marina Vrezovska and her co authors. Hmm? Progress Sorry? Progress or solution? Well, there was progress. <laughs> yes, you're right. It's solved. <laughs> That's what I meant by progress. <laughs> it's not only progress, it's, uh, it's a complete solution. <laughs> Completely fair, yes. Um, so, solution in dimension 8 is a, a lattice called E8. And in dimension 24, it's a lattice called Leach or Lambda 24. And dimension three also a uh, solution is known. Okay. So we will come back and see those lattices again, so that's why I mentioned it now. Okay, so that's uh, if you are an approximation theorist. Now, if you're a PDE person, 
why would you be interested in such things? Or maybe uh, Sorry, not. Uh, yeah. You say in dimension two, uh, Fikete points the problem. I mean, it's large, looks like a uh, triangular. In dimension two, the S goes to infinity also. Does it mean that for all S in dimension two, it should be triangular? Yes, exactly. It is. So uh, I, I can tell you why already. There is actually a property of these lattices which was conjectured by Cohn and Kumar in the, I think in 2009. They said uh, the triangular lattice, so it's called A2, I think, in, uh, in short, because dimension 2, A2, E8, lambda 24, uh, are universally minimizing. So what do they mean by universally minimizing? Give yourself uh, some sort of interaction like that. So i different from j, x i a j being in some ball. And what you want to do is you want to divide by the volume of the ball and let r go to infinity. Okay. Something like that. Right? So it's a, it's a sum of pair interactions. And I'm going to denote it like that. We're going to say it's a function of the square of the distance between the points. So here, this falls kind of in that class, right? Sort of, there is this question of how you define large volume, the large volume problem. So this is supposed to be for an infinite, uh, an infinite configuration of points. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so this is minimal, it's minimized by these lattices. in those respective dimensions whenever f is completely monotone and what they define as completely monotone is this that the derivatives of f have alternate signs so f has to be decreasing and second derivative increasing etc and they had said f smooth right because here you take derivatives Okay, so um, how do I connect with this problem? It doesn't quite fall in the setting because this is uh, completely monotone, but it's not smooth. Okay, but so there is a little thing you can do, which was done in a paper of Mircea Petrake and myself, and says basically this extends to risk interactions. At least uh, Reese, yeah, S less than D. I don't understand. If it's a conjecture, how do you extend it? Well, if their conjecture is true, okay. it implies that it's also true. Okay. Okay. So that's what I mean. Conjecture true implies also true for Reese. Okay, so now there was progress, <laughs> complete progress. In <laughs> is, uh, so there's a theorem now by Kuhn, Kumar, Miller, Rachenko, and Vyazovska. Which is that the conjecture is true for dimension 8 and 24. So dimension 2 is still open, which Okay, at first may seem a little counterintuitive. You would think that dimension two is easier than eight and twenty-four, 
But for this problem, no. Um, and I will just say a word. How do these things go? The idea is a, is a sort of Fourier approach. And uh, uh, they use a sort of calibration or uh, linear programming bound uh, where they basically play with the function and its Fourier transform. And what they do is they see that their, their lower bound, their calibration is going to be saturated at the particular lattice. So they're going to have a sort of equality case everywhere at the lattice, which will give the optimality provided they can, they can construct what they call a magic function, which satisfies certain properties and whose Fourier transform satisfies other properties. So it's very rigid properties that you want the function and its Fourier transform to satisfy. You want the function to vanish exactly. OK, I, I may be a bit wrong, but this is the idea. You want your function to vanish exactly at the points that correspond to the distances on the lattice. And you want the Fourier transform to have a certain sign and a certain interval. And OK, as we know, there's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which tells you that if you f mess around with the, f the function, you're going to pay a price in the Fourier transform. So you cannot play on both sides so easily. Uh, and what Marina Vyazovska did is she found the first magic function that gives you a quality case for d equals 8 in the for the best packing problem. OK, so she found the magic function, which is constructed with modular functions, some sort of transform of modular forms. And uh, in all these uh, magic dimensions are not accidents. I mean, there no. are algebraic reasons. Yeah, so there are, there are some number theory reasons that are uh, hard to penetrate, but these are the only dimensions in which uh, certain lattices, a lattice with certain properties are known to exist. So the properties of the lattice are that basically you want that all the vectors in the lattice, so all the vectors you can construct, when I think it's when you take the square of their norms, it's an even integer or something of that sort. And these things happen in dimensions 8 and 24 oh yeah. and 2. And we don't know of other examples. I mean, I think maybe it could happen in some very large dimensions. Mm, I'm not sure. I think it's only those. And in particular, this thing, the universality, uh, the universal minimizing property is not true in general dimension. So if you look at general dimension, like dimension 3, and if you ask to minimize an interaction energy of this form, the minimizer will depend on the interaction, even monotone interaction. So dimension 3, you have two natural candidates for lattices. You can look at FCC and BCC, for example. D equals 3. You have FCC, the face-centered cubic, and BCC, the body-centered cubic. Uh, this one will be better for uh, long-range interactions, and this one will be better for short-range, meaning the, the value of S. So there's going to be a critical uh, value of S below which one is better and above which the other. I never remember which one. But OK, so it, there is no universally minimizing property. It's not to be expected in all dimensions. No universal minimizer. Moreover, we don't even know, uh, in dimensions different from two, we don't even know who is the best lattice within the class of lattices. So prove, we don't even know how to prove that these guys are the best but within lattices. Sorry, is it known if like a regular lattice exists that minimizes? Because they're also sort of non-periodic. Yes, yeah, so we don't know that uh, that a minimizer is necessarily uh, a lattice. Is that your question? Yeah. No, it's not, and it's not always true. So okay. So first, we don't even we're sure there's it's not there's no universal minimizer, and we're also sure that for d large enough, I think it's uh, around nine or ten, there are minimizers which are not lattices. So even for the best packing problem.
not 24, so it jumps. So you see, wh they, they plot these things, they, they do these things where they have their linear programming bounds, which give them some lower bound, okay, or some upper bound actually. And then they, they plot the best known uh, candidate, right? So they have things like that. And then you see 8 and 24. So this is the dimension. Okay, at 24 and at 8, suddenly you can saturate your, your theoretical bound with these examples. And at all the other dimensions, you don't. And y you see, it's not monotone. But I assume you say that in dimension 3, it was solved as a problem. The best packing problem is solved. Yes. But it's not a universal minimizer. It's, it's the solution for the best packing, not for other... Uh, so uh, when s is infinity, the best packing is when s is infinity. If you take another s, it's very large. Ah, if s is large enough, it's probably the right guy. But if s is small, probably not. You see, because of this, FCC, BCC. This is an example. So this thing is very mysterious. Uh, this whole. Uh, uh, so for instance, so we, we know that in large dimensions, minimizers are not lattices. And the, the heuristic, I think, is that I if you're in very large dimension and you're a lattice, you have a bit too much void. There's many dimensions, right? So you put points in your lattice. It's like you're not filling the space enough. You, you can take advantage of these big gaps that the lattice creates and put more particles, put more spheres. So the they physicists talk about uh, jammed configurations. And people in theoretical computer science are very interested, in fact, in these best packing problems in very large dimensions, when d tends to infinity. Because in coding theory, that's what you want to do. You want to, to pack very large spaces by spheres. So in fact, d large is not just a mathematician's uh, game. It's not very physical. <laughs> Sphere problem becomes like error correcting or yes exactly yeah okay so this conjecture is only expected to be true in dimensions two eight and twenty four and as I said in dimension two it's still not proof even though it's believed to be true but uh, the this sort of construction of magic function uh, has not been yet uh, I think they're stuck. Okay, so this is for the <laughs> number theory part yeah. of the... The magic function from 8 and 24 yeah. are not really related, or they are the same? It's the same, same idea, it's the same, 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 idea. Idea. same idea, yeah. Same idea. So, the, and this is uh, related to what? To what? Why these dimensions are working? Uh, as I said, it's because these lattices in these dimensions satisfy this very particular property that the lengths of the vectors of the lattice are even integers. And so you see that in your magic function, you need those even integers to come out. So I think that's a part of the proof that's understandable, uh, you know, by common people. But uh, If you don't have this property, you are not able to prove something. You are not able to construct the magic function. Uh, yes, like but you can you prove something that... Uh, Something wrong is happening. Well, there are counter examples, but it's, it's you know you, you don't see in the proof. I don't think they can prove Something with these linear programming bounds. I don't think they have proved that it cannot be a lattice and things like that. It cannot be, the proof cannot be sort of used the other way, as far as I understand. Okay, so. <coughs> Um, yes, I, I, I was uh, going to talk about uh, why questions like that can be of interest for PDE or other parts of physics that are, uh, let's say, uh, fluid mechanics and quantum fluid mechanics, I could call that. So this is much. Uh, this is sort of more down to down to earth. The first example is uh, the point vortex system in fluid. In fluid. Is uh, a system where you have an energy which is exactly logarithmic. 
in 2D. And uh, so, and the, so the interaction between the points is logarithmic. So here I, I've assumed that I have only point vortices with charge plus one. It's a, it's a bit of a particular case, but it can happen. And then you have the dynamics, which uh, is really what's called the, the point vortex system. Is you want to take x i dot equals uh, one over n, uh, basically grad perp h n with respect to the entry i. Okay, so you take the gradient of your energy and you rotate it by pi over 2. This is what the perp is supposed to do. Uh, also called the Biot-Savart law in this setting. And then you try to understand the dynamics, the, the evolution of it. In condensed matter physics, what I had, to, what I had in mind was uh, superconductivity and superfluidity. So in that case, you're given a, a Landau theory. So you have, a, you have an order parameter. You have a whole continuum thing. So you have a psi, if you want, that goes from R2 to C, which is a bit like a wave function, except uh, in this context, it's called an order parameter. So it's complex valued. And what uh, you want to understand in this context is are uh, the zeros of psi that are called also the vortices. So you have several setups. You can look at statics. You can look at dynamics. So this is a statics equation. I'm writing in a, the simplest form where I neglect the gauge. So usually it's also it can also be with gauge. Or you can look at the uh, parabolic equation, or you can look at the Schrodinger version, which goes by the name gross pitayevsky And here, epsilon is some small parameter that we're going to say goes to 0 for mathematical purposes. Um, and you can study these PDEs or the energy associated to these PDEs. You can study static configuration, configurations. And you see that as epsilon goes to 0, you can extract a sort of discrete problem. Uh, about the vortices. And, and really, everything happens as if your vortices were points with logarithmic interaction again. And this is 2D. So you can do as if you had something like that. Or in the dynamics situation, here, sorry, here, the corresponding thing is the gradient flow. So uh, we're going to write it like that. And here, the corresponding thing is the same point vortex system. OK, so doing these, this derivation when epsilon goes to 0 from these uh, sort of continuum problems to these discrete problems, that, that took uh, some work. Um, and I would say it was started with uh, ideas of Betuel, Brésil, saint -Hélin. Uh, and Sandier and myself, we did a lot of things on that, and uh, many others as well. Uh, so eventually, we really made rigorous this passage from this, this problem to the discrete problems there. Uh, and in particular, in the regime where both epsilon goes to zero and the number of vortices uh, go to infinity together. So that's... Uh, that's the part that's delicate. Okay, so another 
Another reason to understand these energies, but also these dynamics. What's the relation between understanding the energy and understanding the dynamics? Uh, yeah, you want to do both. You want to understand the energy and you want to understand the dynamics. But let's say it's a good start to, for instance, start by understanding minimizers of the energy because that's a good place to start. But you want to do you want to do everything. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, more probability because uh, I want to look at. Uh, ah, yes, maybe something else I should say about this. Another reason why this is interesting is because we have experiments. In superconductors, we have experiments, uh, in superfluids as well. So we can see what happens in nature. And what happens is if you look at superconductors, uh, let's say a slice of them or a thin film in which you see those vortices, uh, you see, uh, you see super in superconductors perfect triangular lattices again. So the triangular lattice, you really see it in the experiments. Okay? And in, in, in physics, in this context, it's called the Abrikozov lattice. Abrikozov lattice of vortices, and of course it's the, our same lattice A2. Um, so Abrikozov is a physicist. What he did is he took the Landau-Ginzburg theory that that's I wrote here in a simplified form, and he predicted that there should be periodic solutions. Uh, at first he said they were going to be square lattice uh, patterns. So then people did the experiments and they saw these triangular lattices. And then, OK, so apparently they went back to his computations. They said, oh, I just messed up the computation here. It was a triangle. But, um, but it was predicted before it was observed. So that's beautiful. It's not so common. Um, and that gives us, in the end, it will give us a sort of proof by experiment that uh, this thing should be true. Another reason to believe that this is true. Dimension 2, the triangular lattice, should be the best because it's observed. <laughs> All right. Um, so I promised some probability and some statistical mechanics. So now I'm at this level there with the Gibbs measure. So why do we care about uh, Gibbs measures like that? So we have statistical mechanics, but we also have quantum mechanics. And also random matrix theory. Okay, so statistical mechanics, let's say uh, this thing is called the Coulomb gas. Uh, so the Gibbs measure there, this ensemble with Coulomb interaction. It's a Coulomb gas or it's a Ries gas. No, let's call it a Ries gas when the interaction is Ries. And so the Coulomb gas is a sort of a toy model for matter. If you decide that uh, that matter is classical, right? You only look at interactions between um, between atoms uh, or between uh, ions as classical. And apparently, from what I I'm not really not an expert on that, but it's it's relatively reasonable to consider to make this classical approximation when you deal with plasmas. So it's used for plasmas uh, in astrophysics, where they use plasma models. Uh, they also use that. So uh, an important model in physics is what's called the gelium. So it's an infinite configuration or an infinite ensemble of particles of charge plus one. So here you notice that. Uh, Maybe I should have said that from the beginning, but 
my interaction is only repulsive. Right? There's, there's only pure repulsion. All the particles are identical, so they, they all can be seen as charges plus one. All repelling. That's all. And so a gelium is when you take such an ensemble of particles of charge plus one, but you add a neutralizing background that's uniform. Also infinitely extended. Okay. So you imagine the background is charged minus one in density, and you have an infinite number of positive charges, and you try to count the total Coulomb interaction of all that. So it's not quite clear how to count the interaction, you see, because in principle you have to make an infinite sum. So you have dif different possible definitions. You could look at your infinite system. You can count the energy for uh, particles that fall in a certain box and then let the size of the box go to infinity. So there is this ambiguity of the definition which is uh, actually delicate. And we will see questions like that later. Uh, and so they consider that as a toy model for matter. Quantum mechanics is uh, in certain models of uh, free fermions in a trap and things like that. You are given a wave function. So uh, fractional quantum Hall effect, free fermions in a trap. And a few other models from uh, quantum mechanics, you know you're given a, a wave function, psi, x1, xn. And you know that this thing has to be L2 normalized to be a wave function. And you find that psi squared in certain models exactly takes the form of your dpn beta. Right, so like that. And so it's usually for d equals 2, s equals 0. So the logarithmic interaction again. Uh, you see that uh, in a lot of motivations, the interaction is, is logarithmic. OK, so this is a function of x1, xn, and it takes the same form as uh, dpn beta. Uh, and of course, it's normalized. No, but these are like trial states, for instance. Okay. You, you know, in, in the fractional quantum Hall effect, they say, OK, this is an interesting state. Uh, it takes exactly this form. You don't move it. It's a you distinguished. It's a distinguished state, exactly. Or it's a ground state. Or it's a um, and then random matrix theory. OK, so this is a wide topic in which uh, uh, there's, there's a whole literature also. Uh, and the most basic thing is you want to understand, uh, originally it was also started in theoretical physics, uh, with the uh, idea of understanding the spectrum of very large atoms. But also to understand statistics, if I understand uh, correctly, but covariance matrices and so But okay, let's say you want to understand the spectrum of a very large atom. Uh, so what's the spectrum of a very large operator? Uh, you can approximate that by the question of the spectrum of a very large matrix being very large dimension. Um, and then what's the simplest matrix that you can cook up, or maybe the most natural? You just draw the entries at random to be Gaussians. So n by n matrix with Gaussian IID random uh, entries, and let's say complex random matrix. That thing is called the Gini ensemble. So that seems like a very natural idea. 
you can compute the law of the eigenvalues. So you compute its pure algebra and you find oh you find dpn beta with beta equals 2 so it's p beta equals 2 it's the logarithmic interaction in 2d and v is quadratic okay so it's log interaction in 2d because these points the eigenvalues they are complex so I can identify them with points in R2. Right? So uh, what this tells you is that the, the eigenvalues of the Gini ensemble form a 2D log gas or a 2D Coulomb gas at temperature, inverse temperature, beta equals 2. Uh, of course, the other thing that's more maybe more natural for, uh, for physics is originally you want to understand the spectrum of a Hermitian operator, not just a regular operator. So you can decide to impose symmetry. So if you impose that your matrix is real symmetric, then this is what's called the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, and you find Pn, dPn1, I think. But in dimension one, because now the eigenvalues are real. Uh, the interaction is again logarithmic and the potential is again quadratic. And if you decide to do it complex Hermitian, it's called the GUE, and you find DPN2. Again, uh, similar situations. Okay, so the logarithmic situation is really uh, central uh, in this context. And it turns out that for these particular cases, you can compute a lot of things thanks to the matrix model. So thanks to the fact that these are the laws of eigenvalues of a random matrix, this gives you access to a lot of algebraic computations. Uh, and I would say most of the things are now understood about such things. So there is something that's very particular in temperature is beta equals 2 with the logarithmic interaction is called the determinantal case. So it's a case where you can do a lot of these computations I was mentioning. In particular, you can have formulas for correlation functions uh, and all sorts of algebraic things that are accessible only when beta equals 2. Okay, so the eigenvalues repel each other. In fact, that's what you see in uh, histograms of eigenvalues. Um, but now what we want to do is we want to sort of get uh, a bit perpendicular to what random matrix theory does because random matrix theory is uh, it's when you have a matrix model but it's these sort of particular values of beta and we want to go, go sort of perpendicular in the sense that we want to vary beta and also we want to free ourselves from having to be in dimension one or two so we want to consider also dimension three and four and higher mm -hmm. and possibly these other interactions Okay, so everything I'm going to discuss applies in these cases, uh, but sometimes it's less precise than what's known in these very special cases. Uh, often it's less precise. So these are the uh, um, the things that are very standard, and as I said, it's it's Dyson uh, I think who first noticed that the law of the eigenvalues of these random matrix ensembles is a Coulomb gas, and you could understand it that, that way. And finally, there's other uh, motivations in uh, statistical mechanics that correspond to another generalization, which I'm not going to talk about in this course, but which would be the case where I allow to consider plus and minuses. So if I uh, have interactions, if, if I allow to have 
n pluses, for instance, and n minuses, then it's quite a different story. And that's called a two-component plasma. Okay. So physicists call such a thing a plasma, a one-component plasma. One component because there's only one species of particles, if you want. And a two-component plasma, it's the logarithmic interaction with plus minus charges. And that has kept people busy also very much because uh, in such a model you expect to have a costerlitz tauless or BKT phase transition. Um, and okay, so we're also working on uh, using some ideas from the Coulomb gas to, to, to study things like that. Okay, so if you want to take a break, it's now a good time to take a break because I'm sort of transitioning to. Uh, transitioning. I'm phase transitioning, uh, okay. or you can you ask questions. Or How do you get to do this? Oh, okay. We can take but maybe two questions at the end. Oh, okay. No, but it, may, we can do both. Both questions and a break, I don't know. Okay. Uh, so let's start with the questions. Do, do you allow the, the, the charges here to merge the plus and minus or? Right, so I, that's a problem. In principle, they could merge, but uh, so what you do is you you look only at the Gibbs measure setting in which the partition function is well defined, and that's the case where temperature is when beta is less than two, then basically you have enough uh, heat, <laughs> enough thermal agitation to prevent the particles from merging. If you want to go above beta equals two you have to truncate your interaction in some way to continue to make sense to the system. So what, what people more commonly study, is they study the model on a lattice. So when you're on a lattice, you don't have the problem of collapse, of colliding, because well, they're not in the same site. Um, but yes, maybe it's an opportunity to say that these problems in statistical mechanics, they are considered difficult because it's not on a lattice, you're on the continuum. And it's long range, right? It's not only nearest neighbors. You don't see only your nearest neighbors. All the particles see all the particles. And the Coulomb interaction doesn't decay very fast. So it's not integrable at infinity. So, so things are long range. Yes, you may have problem both for small and Yeah, for you have two problems, yeah. Both for small and for large, exactly. But we will see how to resolve both. <laughs> 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 There's more questions. So maybe uh, we take a break, but okay, seven minutes. <laughs> You're the boss. <laughs> what we will try to do is uh, okay. The, the, the really the first order of business is to understand H n well, because if you understand H n well, and maybe minimizers, uh, you make uh, you make progress, and then of course you want to understand what happens when you add temperature, but you also want to understand dynamics. Uh, here I will say minimizers. Dynamics of the form that I mentioned. So gradient flows. You see here it's gradient flow with an average. So it's the mean field regime where each particle feels the average effect of the other particles, or maybe a conservative flow, where I take some anti-symmetric operator, just like my rotation by, by over two. So that's uh, conservative. And this is gradient flow. And uh, more ambitious is to try to do Newton's law. Uh, double dot equals equals the average force and then maybe also these uh, evolutions with noise so we can do also uh, 
Possibly, if I have a color chalk. Uh, no, no color. Yes. But that's okay. That's okay, that's okay. Don't worry. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's very good. Uh, maybe you want to add this plus 1 over square root beta times the Brownian motion. You can do it here too. And then uh, you have a uh, possible Langevin dynamics whose um, invariant measure is the Gibbs measure. So you connect a little bit with the other problem. Yeah. So in all these setups, maybe the first order of business is to try to understand the empirical measure. Empirical measure. What does it converge to? as n goes to infinity. So here, for minimizers, there's going to be a, a mu. And here, there's going to be an evolving mu, an evolving density. And we will want to know what is the PDE that, that density solves. <coughs> OK, so that's the sort of mean field level, or macroscopic. level. But then we, uh, if possible, want to do more. So if you know what your mu is, your macroscopic density, you want to see really these macroscopic patterns. Because you remember, in the end, we want to understand maybe these triangular lattices and all blah. So we want to see what's happening at the micro scale. So the fluctuations, for instance, what is the difference between the empirical measure and your limiting measure? You can make the difference. You can multiply by n, for instance. What is the behavior of that? Uh, what happens when you look at a box? Uh, how many points you have in the box? So of course, you know the number of points in the box is going to be well approximated by the integral of mu in the box, or n times the integral of mu in the box. But what are the corrections? And can you do that on smaller and smaller boxes? Can you say how many points you have down to the micro scale? Okay. So actually, what the number of points in a box minus the expected one, which is this. That's called the discrepancy in a box. A box can be a ball or a cube or whatever you like. Can you have it down to micro scale? Can you understand the limit point process? Is there a limit point process? And how does everything depend on beta? Because when things are probabilistic, you don't have a limit configuration. You have a random configuration, so limit point process. How do things depend on beta? How do things depend on v? Is it really dependent on v, or is there some universality? And of course, you also want how do things depend on s? Can you extend to other? interactions. So let me tell you right away that our understanding is only partial. So this thing is about getting the macroscopic level. That's done. Check, 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 check. These things. OK. But getting to the next order, uh, that's only more in the uh, statistical mechanics context. Or minimizers. Of course, minimizers, you can insert it in this problem because that's beta equals infinity, right? formally. Uh, but understanding number of points in a box, for instance, in general, we don't. We understand weak, weaker things than that. But I'll show you some replacements. OK, so now, uh, to be very precise, you, you understand that when you have n points like that in a confined region, there is going to be a length scale, the micro scale, is n to the minus 1 over the dimension. 
okay, because each point uh, occupies uh, 1 over n volume. So, so you, you will see that scale come out very often. Okay. So let me start by um, what is known about this limiting mu in the simplest setting. I lost my uh, eraser. Ah, yes. OK, so first, if you want to describe. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, usually there's like a little uh, yeah. petite gouttière, là, on peut mettre. Je refais pas le même truc. Hein. Non, j'ai compris, j'ai compris. OK, so uh, as I was saying, the first order of business is you want to understand HN well. OK? So when you look at HN, and let's forget about probability until at least Monday. Uh, when you look at HN, let's write again what it is. With my uh, particular cases, um, well, you're tempted to look at this. Because now here there is no m there is no n anymore, right? And so if if you plug in mu equals uh, mu equals the empirical measure, for instance, formally it's going to look like the energy, right? So it's going to look like n squared times the energy. Except, uh, yeah, so if you look at that, E of mu n, so call that mu n, maybe. Right. E of mu n. I let you do the computation in your mind. Yes? You believe me? No, you can do it. You can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you see that there is, there is a mistake, which is that you have to worry about removing the self-interactions. Here it's i different from j, and here if you integrate in Rd cross Rd, you will get infinities. Hmm? So be careful of self-interactions to be removed. But OK, still at leading order, this is not bad. And this uh, tells you that if you want to minimize the energy, for instance, you should think of minimizing E. OK, so minimizers of E, what are they like? Well, now E is something that's defined over probability measures, OK? Mu is supposed to be a probability measure. So this is a function on probability measures. If you look at it, uh, yes, and one, yes. Uh, if you look at it, uh, you, you will see that it's convex. It's strictly convex, in fact. So in terms of minimizers, it's very good. We're going to have a unique minimizer if it exists. And uh, in fact, if V grows sufficiently, and if S is less than D, because if S is not less than D, this thing doesn't even make sense. Because the in again for uh, completely monotone, right? That you have uh, I'm not even completely monotone here. I'm, I'm really, I'm very specific. I'm, I'm a power. Okay, right? no, it's a power okay. uh, so I'm, I'm S, 1 over S, X minus S. Mm. Okay. So you don't want to go beyond D, because if you go beyond D, uh, 1 over X, S is, is not integrable near 0. So this thing will not make sense. So it's a different regime. So I will, from now on, always assume that S is less than D. The regime S bigger than D is a regime where actually the interaction is much more short range. It decays faster. And what happens is in, in some sense easier because you don't have to take care about very long range effects. You can only think in terms of near particles. But it's a very different regime that's also been studied. Okay, 
I, I'm also particularly interested in Coulomb, which falls in this uh, interval. So if V grows sufficiently and S is less than D, then there is a unique minimizer. And it's called the equilibrium measure, or the Frostman equilibrium measure. And let's denote it. It's not very good notation, but mu sub v should be mu sub v and g, but OK. So what is the equilibrium measure like? There is one case that's easy. It's when g is Coulomb and v is quadratic, then mu v is uh, it's going to be an indicator function of a ball or an ellipse. So let's say, yeah, uh, let's say v is x squared. Uh, but if it's not x squared, you, you transform your ball into an ellipse or something. So then mu v is an indicator function of a ball up to proper normalization by the volume of the ball. And maybe the ball is not of radius 1, but OK. So it's a nice measure. It has a uh, compact support. So it's always compact support. Huh? If V grows sufficiently fast, because you, s you remember V confines things to live in a fixed size domain. So typically, it's going to have compact support. <coughs> and this example tells us it it's a measure with the density. Uh, there's other examples that are known, like the semicircle law. In general, we cannot compute explicitly the, the equilibrium measure. We can connect it with an obstacle problem in calculus of variations, but um, the boundary of the support, so we're going to call sigma the support of the equilibrium measure. The boundary uh, of the support is uh, sort of given implicitly. It's, it's, a, it's a solution to a free boundary problem, if you want. OK, so assume now, from now on, that mu v is a measure with compact support and that it has a density on its support, which is regular enough. It doesn't have to be constant like this, but, but it, could, it could vary. But we're going to assume that it's regular enough. So that's a sort of sufficiently generic case. Um, and what you might want to know is that mu v is uniquely characterized by a certain Euler-Lagrange type uh, equation, because it comes from a variational problem. So it's uniquely characterized by the fact that the total potential, h mu v plus v, I'm going to define, is bigger than a certain constant. So there exists a constant. Since that this is bigger than a certain constant everywhere and equal to C in the support, so it's quasi everywhere in the support of mu v. And where uh, we can call that theorem. Huh? And what is H mu v? So for any measure distribution mu, I'm going to use this notation many times. H mu is going to be the convolution of G with mu. So what you should think of is it's the potential generated by mu. So if you do electrostatics and you're in the Coulomb case, it's really the electric potential uh, that's generated by, by the distribution of charges. Okay, so this is Potential theory, the, the object of potential theory was initially to understand the distribution of charges in a capacitor. Is, is, it, is it what you call the obstacle problem, this, this equation? Uh, yes, so in fact, this is an obstacle problem on H mu v. Because H mu v is bigger than a certain thing, uh, it coincides with a certain function uh, on a set, and the Laplacian of it is zero uh, outside of this set because the Laplacian of h mu v is mu v. 
So outside of the support is zero. So if you are an analyst, you can see it as an obstacle problem. If it is exactly the, the, the Coulomb case. In the Coulomb case, yes. So in the Coulomb case, it's an obstacle problem. In the risk case, it's a fractional obstacle problem. Very good. Okay. But uh, for what I'm going to discuss, I'm not going to need that. But it's just good to know. So we're going to use just this characterization. So now you can prove it is, it is true that the equilibrium measure is the limiting behavior for a minimizer. So theorem, for instance, and uh, I don't attribute this to anybody, but I think it's Choke, apparently, people say. So if Xn minimizes Hn, then the empirical measure converges to the equilibrium measure. So I mean, my assumptions where there is a unique equilibrium measure, okay, and Hn of Xn, which is the minimum energy, uh, is asymptotic to n squared e of mu as n goes to infinity. So meaning this representation here, this approximation, is correct. You can indeed neglect the self-interactions in a first understanding. That's okay. for any beta. There's no beta. There's no beta. I minimize the energy. Okay, now with beta, with beta, you have a large deviations principle uh, with speed. Okay, so I had this, I don't know if you remember, there was an n minus s over d. So it's going to be n minus s over d plus 2. And good rate function E minus E of mu V. So what that means, if you are not uh, an LDP person, it, it means that the probability that the empirical measure looks like mu is exponential minus beta times this thing that's very large times e of mu minus e of mu v. So this was first proved by uh, Benarus and Guillaume in the log case in 1D and then Benarus and Zetouni in the log case in 2D but in fact you see you look at the proof and you find that you can do it in any D for all these Coulomb and Ries cases. It's not really so hard and it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't use very much the structure of the interaction G. So you could do it for much more general Gs and it would be fine. Same proof. So what this tells you, you look at it, it tells you this probability will be exponentially small because this is very large. 2 minus s over d is always positive. This is a very large number, and so the exponential is very small unless this is 0. So this is always non-negative because mu v is the minimizer. So when, do you, uh, when does it achieve 0? Well, at mu v, it's the unique minimizer. OK, so it means it all concentrates near mu v. Uh, and so it says that. Um, if you add temperature, you continue to see the same situation. Well, if this thing is actually large, because now you could decide that you don't like my normalization and you, let, you want to let beta continue to depend on n. So you could take beta very, very small, means you increase the temperature. And so you see that, in fact, it depends on whether this parameter is very small, uh, is very large or not. So, in fact, there is, this is a regime, in a sense, wi with small temperature. And that's why you see uh, the same behavior as for minimizers. 
so the true parameter is that you should look at theta equals beta n 1 minus s over d for this problem. So apparently I have some, uh, maybe I have some factors wrong. No. Huh. So anyway, yeah. What's the regime for epsilon? So it, 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 the epsilon, you know, here you're supposed to take limit when epsilon goes to zero. It's just the definition of large deviations. So I'm cheating a bit because you have. No, a well, I was wondering about epsilon and then. No, no, I'm 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 not moving. So. Okay, so. So this, this gives us the answer to the leading order behavior. Can you explain why theta is a good parameter? Because here you have yes. n to 2 minus. So I know, I, I, that's why I was asking myself uh, what, what exactly the same right. question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as I was writing it, I was like, ah, oh, it's not the same. Um, next time. <laughs> no, no, but so I, I want to, um, OK, so in here, you don't see it like that. But I I the reason is that you should not consider, when beta is very small, this is the parameter that you should look at. And um, yes, I will have to reconcile this computation in my mind later. But wha what I can tell you is that, um, is that if theta is much bigger than 1, then mu v is the correct limit uh. maybe because you, you need at least some exponential minus n uh, decay and if it's below uh, then yeah that's uh, one thing but I think no no but I think I may, maybe I just messed up some uh, some stupid factor because I did this thing in my class. Uh. Yes, 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 yes. No, it's it's correct. It's because what you want exactly. You want to look at the speed n. What's happening at speed n? Because in fact, what's happening is that you have e to the minus beta n, e to the minus n, if you want, times theta, because that's uh, yes. theta is that, plus the entropy. So you have theta e minus e of mu plus the entropy. And so you see that this is uh, at the level n, you should pair it like that. So that's what I was going to say. When uh, theta is much bigger than 1, mu v is correct, the correct limit. If not, we need to look at a thermal e equilibrium measure. So I'm, I'm sorry, notation is really horrible, but I don't have a better name than mu theta, uh, which minimizes now e of mu plus 1 over theta integral of mu log mu. So you want to add a little bit of entropy to your problem. And so you see that if you believe in this heuristics, it's going to now give you an LDP at speed n theta with uh, energy or rate function e theta. So I call that e theta. OK? So <coughs> this guy you can also try to minimize. So you see, when theta is very, very large, it goes back to the equilibrium measure. And otherwise, this thing, what it's going to do is it's going to add some tails. So you know how the equilibrium measure was compactly supported. So it was doing something like that, or maybe like that. Now this guy, the thermal equilibrium measure, is going to have exponential tails, or ex typically exponential tails. So it's going to come like that. And it's going to decay slowly at infinity. Uh, sorry, fast, actually, at infinity. So it is not compactly supported anymore. It always has full support. So this is mu v. 
And this is mutita. Mutita always has full support. It's also a probability. Um, and it's actually a more correct description. But the rigidity will disappear in this regime, no? If theta is not... So if theta is fixed, a certain amount of rigidity will disappear, but you can do the OLDP now with this, this new rate function. Uh, the thing that um, I've sort of discovered is that even if theta is very large, this thing is still a better description than the equilibrium measure. So if theta is very large, you see this uh, layer here, you can actually uh, find it to be 1 over square root theta. It's going to be very small, so you're going to have a sort of boundary layer behavior. But this guy is a sort of correction to the mu v, which is more precise. And so if you work with this guy, even with theta very, very large, you are making a uh, better... Uh, you are being more accurate, in fact, than with the equilibrium measure. So thermal equilibrium measure is good. Now let me show you, for instance, what you can do with that. So you see, it contains the possibility of small outliers, like sometimes the particles can go far. So the more temperature, the more you will have particles that sometimes escape the confinement. So the thermal equilibrium measure satisfies a p another PDE, I mean, you know, another uh, characterization, which is an equation which I had somewhere, but maybe not. Okay. So mu theta solves. So it's a bit like earlier, right? You have h mu theta plus v, but now I think it's plus 1 over theta log mu theta is constant. And now that's everywhere. You don't have to distinguish inside, outside. Um, so you can just compute it from that, make variations in your variational problem. It's not, uh, not difficult. Okay, so now uh, since uh, we... Uh, yeah. Question. Uh, when you write for IID variables, rate function of large deviation for the empirical measure, this is sort of theorem, you get the... Uh, entropy, in yeah. the usual entropy, this as the rate function up there. N uh, mu log mu, yes. Yes, but uh, this corresponds to the ca case of independent uh, random variables. Yes. Wh when do we have and what is about the uh, asymptotic independence of particles under P uh, and beta? Ah, so, so at leading order, uh, if you want, from this point of view, you have you have to superimpose, you have to tilt your uh, independent variables by this energy, right? It's, a, it's like a tilting principle. So you have the entropy plus this yes. thing. And, and you, have the, you have this sort of independence because you have convergence of the empirical measure, right? Yes, so you have... So now chaos, you have chaos in the, if you want, at leading yes. order, yes. So at leading order, you will, uh, and, yeah. then, uh, so you, and then you have the uh, corrections. Yes. Yes, so now we want to understand the correction. Okay, so since we want to understand the corrections, we want to sort of go to the next order, and I said the, the main point is understand first the energy. So energy at next order, what do we do? So we're going to do something that I call splitting, which is really to literally algebraically expand the energy to next order. So we're going to rewrite it as uh, n squared. I'm going to write in integral form, right? So the, this is the empirical measure. Okay, mu n, the empirical measure. Uh, 
And now I have to pay attention, I remove the diagonal. So this triangle here denotes the diagonal. You remove the diagonal in order not to do, not to count the self-interactions. And this is exact. Huh? So this is honest. So far, we haven't done much. And now we're going to expand around the uh, equilibrium measure. So there's two choices here. There's two options. Either you expand around mu v or around mu theta. They both give a fairly interesting answer. Uh, and I'm going to do it around mu theta for today, but you could do the other one. OK, so let's just write it as mu theta plus an error. So, so homework for tomorrow, do it with mu v, and you'll see uh, it also works in three lines very nicely. And you need to use this characterization. OK. <coughs> so now I expand, right? So what am I going to get at leading order in mu theta? I get g minus y, d mu theta, d mu theta. And in v also. OK. Now here, whether I have the diagonal or not, uh, it doesn't change anything because this is, a, this is a nice measure with the density. It doesn't charge the diagonal. It doesn't charge small sets. So I can just put back everything. And then let's look at the cross terms. So I'm going to have n. I'm going to have 2n, in fact, because there's going to be twice the same term. And if you look at g x minus y d mu theta, you may recognize there's going to be h mu theta. And so I remind you that h mu is g convolved with mu. So you recognize a convolution here. And then it's integrated against this guy plus v. Agree? I want everyone to agree. No, no, I, exactly. It's Thumbs up. Thumbs <laughs> I, w I just want to make sure you're on board, that's all. OK, so this is the uh, sort of linear terms in mu n minus mu theta. Right? And then I'm going to have the quadratic terms. OK, and this term, I need to continue to remove the diagonal because there's, there's some Dirac's in there. So I have to do it. So the first line, it's easy. It's the energy of mu theta. So I have. OK, so I'm going to write this as 1 plus 2 plus 3. So 1 is n squared, the energy of mu theta. 2 is n times 2 times h mu v, h mu theta plus v. OK, but h mu theta plus v. We have it here, h mu theta plus v. This is minus. So it's a constant minus 1 over theta log mu theta. OK, so let me expand. The constant, I'm not going to see because I have two probability measures here, mu n minus mu theta. So when you integrate, constant disappears. And then what we have also is minus 2n over theta integral of mu theta log mu theta. Uh, 
And then I'm going to have a minus 2n over theta. So maybe minus 2 over theta sum of log mu theta of xi. So it, it, it should recouple to make my uh, e theta of, me, of mu theta, but I don't know <laughs> if I did it well. It should work. Okay. Because I have a sign problem. So what about the n prefixes? Why so does the first one have n squared in the second? Ah, because it's n times the uh, the Yeah, why do I have n no 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 you're right, there is yeah. It's n squared. It's n squared. It's n squared. Thank you. It's n squared and also here it's n squared. Okay. And the sign is wrong, you said? This one is a plus? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so now it's time to introduce my uh, <laughs> next. One and one N and the, um, ah, yes. The this one has an N then. Exactly. Okay, so now uh, w w we're going to introduce the next um, character in the story. <laughs> I don't know how to call it like that. The hero. Ah, hero is maybe a. So it's it's going to go by the name modulated energy sometimes, or a next order electric energy. Or next order energy. So let's denote it like that. So you're given a um, configuration Xn in Rdn, and you're given, let's say, a probability density mu. Uh, you've seen probably that I I, uh, I use mu uh, for the probability. I use mu for the density. I don't change the name. Huh? I hope you don't mind. So this is a reference probability. This is the configuration. So this is the energy of Xn relative to this reference probability. It's going to be defined like that. So I double integrate away from the diagonal. And I do basically the empirical measure minus mu, except that uh, I've normalized it differently, but it's the same. OK? So this is the object. So it's really like the Coulomb energy or the Ries energy, except now I have a system where I have my n positive charges, but they also interact with a sort of negative reference charge minus n mu. It has a density, it's, it's a nice diffuse charge. But you see that the system is neutral. Right? So this is a, a neutral system. There is n pluses and n minuses. And you count the whole interaction energy except you have to be careful of removing the diagonal. So what, I, what do I have in three? I have exactly that. So uh, uh, up to the fact that I messed up the one halves maybe, but OK, so three is Fn. So let's try to put everything together. <coughs> Thank you. 
So we have seen that Hn is equal to, so because I had one half that I forgot, um, I'm going to, uh, so you see, if I put the one half correctly, uh, then there is no two here, <laughs> there is no two here, and there is no two here. Because this one doesn't have the two, this one has a one half, and this one has a one half. So now I can group this term and this term. to be n squared e theta of mu theta. So e theta is the thing where I put e and I add 1 over theta mu log mu. I can put fn, xn mu theta. And I have a sort of effective um, potential. Right? This is like a potential energy. And what is my effective potential? It's log mu theta. So if you think of what this does, this actually confines you to be uh, in the support of mu v. If you go far, this is very uh, this is very large because mu theta is very small, so minus log is very large. So this is uh, this is a sort of effective confinement. This term is constant, very nice. And so now we see what we have to understand is this next order term. Now if you plug into the Gibbs measure, what do you find? So you have e to the minus beta. I had this thing, which I put like that. Minus, uh, okay, so I forgot some thetas here. It's n over theta. Right, so minus n. And what is theta? Beta n, 1 minus s over d. Right, so this is theta. Okay, so what we can do, we can take out constant terms. And I forgot Fn. So constant terms, e to the minus beta n 2 minus s over d, e theta or mu theta. All this is constant, we don't really care. And now, e to the minus, so observe how the n minus s over d are going to cancel. The betas, uh, yes, yeah, so I want to keep that. Beta n minus s over d fn of xn. And what's interesting is that in this log term, I have. Um, lot of cancellation or of simplification. So the betas go away, the n minus s over d go away, and the n and the n also go away. So they all go away. So exponential minus minus log. That's what I have. It's just mu theta. So in fact, I see d mu theta of x1, d mu theta of xn. I just take down the log. So, if you see it like that, you have a Gibbs measure where you're throwing your particles according to the distribution mu theta and adding an interaction, which is Fn.
So really, it suffices to study e to the minus beta n minus s over df n of x n mu d mu d mu. I'm, I'm going to call that k of mu, the normalization. That's the same, Gibbs measure. It's just that now, I, I, if I want, I can just do it for a generic measure of mu. Okay, so for a generic, I can forget that mu theta came from this equilibrium measure problem. So mu theta, <laughs> in some sense, it is. Uh, given once for all, once theta is, is fixed. And maybe sometimes it is even explicit for some particular choice of uh, V, but uh, yes. uh, something. Yes, except that in fact, you could, should remember that theta depends on N. Uh -huh. So the mu theta, it, it's also varying with N, but the variations of it with N are very nice. And uh, in fact, as, as N gets large, it's, it's uh -huh. becoming sharper and sharper like that. Uh, you might find this unpleasant that it depends on n, but my claim is that it, it, it doesn't bother so you. It doesn't bother you. In fact, we can we have a paper. Okay, in the Coulomb case, we can quantify very precisely how this converges to mu v by P PD methods. Uh, we quantify uh, uh, with rates. You have exact. You know the s the, sh the size of the of the boundary layers. Everything is quite precise. Uh, but if you don't like this, you have the homework for tomorrow. Or on mu v. Exactly. The homework uh, for tomorrow is do it with mu v. Then what you get is just slightly less pleasant because it's going to be e to the minus beta n minus s over d f n of x n mu v. So that's nice because mu v does not depend on n. But the price to pay is you have an effective potential now. Uh, no free lunch. No free lunch, exactly. Plus, uh, so I have to remember the exact scaling. I'm not sure, but there is a n sum of zeta of xi. And uh, the other thing that you have that is less nice is that you don't have d mu d mu as your reference measure. You have the Lebesgue measure, dx1, dxn. So you have to worry about infinities, whereas this one is a probability, it's integrable. This one is not integrable in the whole space. But it's OK, you can also work with that. And what is zeta? What is zeta? Zeta is the other effective confinement. H mu v plus v minus constant, which if you remember, I told you in the characterization up here, zeta is non-negative, and it's 0 in the support of mu v. So this is an inactive confinement when you're in the support, and it's active just to control outliers. Um, yeah, just to control outliers. So this works perfectly fine as well. But, uh, as I said, in the end, mu theta is always more precise. So if you have the courage, you can work with it. And when you want to do just minimizers, you, you don't uh, care about putting this in the Gibbs measure. You just say that you need to minimize this plus this. So this you minimize by making it 0. Uh, so minimizers are also the same as minimize zeros of fn xn mu, mu v. OK, so what we have seen is that uh, the minimal energy, for instance, was of order n squared, because it looks like this. but now there is a next order guy, next order term. And the question is, what is this next order? What is the order of that guy? And my claim is that this is going to be lower order 
typically it's always going to be, so at least for most configurations, of order n to the 1 plus s over d. And I point out that 1 plus s over d is strictly less than 2 because s is strictly less than d. So this is a lower order. It's really a correction. It's a lower order thing. Remember that if you're in the logarithmic case, s is 0. So it's order n. Um, and s equals d is critical. s equals d critical. You, you don't touch s equals d. So what we have done so far is just, if you want, remove away the, in the dominant part, which is constant, put it aside, just put it in aside in some big can constant that simplifies with z, and now we can start working with the next order. Mm. So far, it's just pure algebra. There is no, there is no asymptotics. There is nothing. So this is an, this is all identities. Uh, and so now I see it's 3.30, so tomorrow I start working just with this quantity. Mm. So the choice of Uge Musita is to get the right cancellation, then you go... Uh, you go in yeah, so, so you do a Taylor expansion if you want, right? This is your minimizer. When you Taylor expand near the minimizer, the linear terms cancel, and you get only quadratic terms. So this is your quadratic term. Mm. So if you, lin if you linearize around the right guy, you will, you will get rid of the linear terms and you can look at the quadratic terms. But now we can completely forget what uh, mu uh, was coming from. In particular, when we do dynamics, it's going to be very useful to consider this as a general function. Because now we're going to plug in for mu, we're going to plug in the limiting PD solution. So the density that mm -hmm. you want to, that you want to uh, show that you converge to, you're going to put it here. So this thing is going to be like a distance, in fact, between your empirical measure and your reference measure mu. Like it to be strictly it's, like a, it's like a Coulomb distance. It's not at all convex. It's, 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 so it's terribly not convex, terribly but, uh, convex, but it works still. So it's like a in, a, in the limit, if you want, it becomes convex. But as a function of the points, it's, terri it's, it's terribly not convex. So it's, it's, it's completely convex in terms of probability of measure, measures. Convex of the measure, it's but not of the point, of course. Exactly. So that's, the, that's mm, actually yes, the catch yes, uh, somehow. Yes, yes, but yes. So, so, so tomorrow I want to do a sort of, uh, if you want, functional analysis on this thing, just to study it and understand its properties and how it really behaves like a good kind of distance. So it's like a Coulomb distance or a Ries distance. And uh, from its properties, we're going to deduce a lot of, uh, of things already because it controls, uh, uh, it, it really controls uh, how much you look like mu, which is what you wanted to know. So what, what, what do you expect as the size of the fluctuation? So the difference between uh, the empirical measure yes. and the mu? Uh, so you want me to tell you already? Uh, no, just the size. So, if you like, if you look at that, right? It depends what you test against. Right, do you put a smooth function here? If you put a smooth function, uh, I will show you that uh, we can answer this question in two D, in the two D log case, uh, in the smooth smooth function case. This is going to be of size one over n. So it's very small. But if you put an indicator function here, for instance, you're counting number of points in the box. So you have very big boundary effects because the points can you know, take a lattice even and count the number of points of your lattice in the box. If you move your box a little bit, you fluctuate a lot. So for indicators, this is expected. There's conjectures by physicists, many conjectures on how big this should be. This would be much uh, much bigger already than for smooth functions. And in higher dimensions, we don't have uh, we have conjectures, but we don't have answers. We don't have proof. But uh, what you can see already on this result is that this is very different from IID uh, scaling. 
Right, because if you had an IID scaling, this would be uh, one over square root n, and this is not the case. It, so it will depend on the dimension. So the, con the conjectures, the formal computation, is that th th there is a power that depends on s and d, and so in dimension three you have some one thirds or some one six. So it, it's dimension dependent. And it converts to something which is. Uh, a random variable or something which is deterministic? Yeah, a random variable. Uh, so, so in 2D, the proof we have is that not this thing, but the inverse Laplacian of this. So if you want the potential, but you're, you're, you're killing the suspense a little bit. But, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this thing <laughs> is going to convert to a Gaussian free field. So you have a, you have a, a limiting object. As a random, as a random object, if you have temperature. But it's really of the order of order n. Yes. Uh, with, with smooth test functions, yes. At least, at least in two D, we have a proof. Hmm? This is also expected in higher dimension. Uh, so in higher dimensions, something like that is expected. But as I said, the the power depends on the dimension, and I don't know it by heart, but I have it in my. Uh, so there's something about d minus two and something, but so, so something like that, I think is expected, but um, it's not completely clear because there there could be phase transitions, there could be critical temperatures at which it fails, for instance. So I would expect it's true, but maybe not for all temperatures and. Uh, I I'll show you how I have a sort of conditional result that says if you can prove free free energy expansions with a precise enough rate, then you deduce a central limit theorem in any dimension. But I don't know how to prove the free expansion results with the, the right rate. Um, so 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 this thing will be very complete directly di related to free energy expansions in fact. So I'll show you that uh, Monday, probably. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. In the list of problems that you mentioned at the very beginning, so there was this uh, problem at uh, equilibrium for the energy, then uh, the dynamics and different types of dynamics and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I would like to know whether there is something about uh, uh, out of equilibrium problem in the sense that you have a kind of stationary forcing or some boundary conditions or things like this. or. Is it completely well, uh, you can uh, cons you can always consider that, but I don't know any. I don't know a study of that that corresponds to a situation like that. No. Now I will elaborate on Laura's question. Ah, you know what she has in mind. <laughs> no, 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 but no, 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 but I mean the problem is you put at some point you put the Newton equation. Yes. When you put the Newton, of course, the the measure. Its measure is xi and vi, and yes. you have to put, for instance, the, the Gaussian in, in vi, and then you have a, a x and v gain. Yes, yeah, so you have a kinetic equation in the limit, and you want to show convergence to Vlasov Poisson uh, if uh, that's what you believe. So I, I, when I talk about dynamics, I'll try to mention that. Yes. But I mean, also at the, at the level of the measures, you may add the exponential minus beta v square or th uh, in the. Uh, in the measure situation or things like this? Uh, so you, we, we will cook up a, a, a modulated uh, energy that has a kinetic part also. Okay. A kinetic energy plus a potential energy. So this will be the potential energy, and you can add a suitably cooked kinetic energy. And then the method uh, w works completely fine as long as you're in the monokinetic case. Ah, <laughs> There's a catch. This is what there was in uh, read in your abstract. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. Cool. So you want to hear about that? Of course. I'll mention that. Uh, okay, I'll mention that. Um, so you have to be here tomorrow, <laughs> do your homework, <laughs> and Monday <laughs> and Tuesday. Okay. She has all the tricks. Très bien. Notre question. Peut-être pas. On va remercier notre speaker. Merci.